Hello, uh, this is Matthew Chan and Wes Weaver, and we welcome you to the, our latest episode of Turnkey Investor TV. And in today's uh, topic, we're going to talk about real estate niches. Now, part of our core audience is to educate beginning real estate investors, and so we thought that it might be helpful for those of you who to be learn more about the different niches and how this might fit into. <clears throat> how this might fit into your overall strategy. Now I've got a list here and that we're gonna talk about. So Wes, I'm gonna quiz you here, so get okay. ready. The first thing I wanna talk about is wholesaling um, and assignment. Now, as we understand it, wholesaling is basically finding a good deal, collecting a finder's fee, and just moving on, right? right. right. So why is it that you and I have never gotten, gotten into that business? Well, to start off, you said this is going to be talking about real estate investing. So I don't even know why we're talking about those. Because <laughs> those aren't the... Jesus. So, you took it out. You took it out. You took my steam. I was going to say okay, that. So, so th those aren't even, you know. But... Yeah, th that is true. It, it is not investing. It right. is a freaking job. Right. You know, you, you just, you're just you owning your own job. And that can be okay if that's what you're after. You know, right. If that's your philosophy, that's what you're in it for, then go for it. But... I, Matt and I are not expertises in wholesaling, mm -hmm. flipping contracts, or assigning contracts. You know, the thing about it is, I think what draws people, so many people, is they say they don't have any money in their bank or they don't have any credit. So the idea of flipping a property for, say, $500, $1,000, $1,500, whatever the amount is, sounds very attractive. Right. And I gotta tell you, it sounds even attractive to me. It however. Can, however, you know, <clears throat> most people look at <clears throat> When I find people who are looking at flipping a contract or, or especially flipping a house or doing a rehab, they look at the first number and the last number and they subtract the two and they say, okay, well, I can make $20,000. What they don't realize or what you may not realize is there is a conglomeration of figures that are in the middle of those two numbers, being the purchase price and the sales price. There's a whole heap of numbers that people don't take into consideration. And when you, the, the reality of those numbers, to me, unless you're in a, unless you're in a booming market in a big city, to me, <clears throat> flipping and rehabbing is just very tough. And at the end, of, at the end of the day, in my opinion, it just it's just not worth it to me. Well, the thing about it is, I mean, a lot of people talk about bird dogging. I yeah. mean, um, for wholesaling, and I suppose it is a good way. I know there's a couple of reputable people that you know promote that. They say it's a good way to get in there and meet mm -hmm. the community and so forth. But I guess for me personally, it just has no attraction because. I don't feel like, you know, I mean, I guess maybe I was brought up in a different situation. I mean, there's no time like the present, mm -hmm. and that's get into the business of the core real estate, not just trying to do some surfacey transactions for one or two grand. Yeah. I think that getting into the core issue is a little bit more important. Yes, you do sacrifice some short-term income, mm -hmm. but that's why you wouldn't necessarily quit your job right away, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, to do that. Yeah. Uh, so if you're good at bird dogging or if you're good at assigning contracts, that means you're already finding the good deals if, if people are willing to buy them. So in my opinion, you're stepping over the dollars to get the pennies. And that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. If you're already doing the work to find the deal, then get into the game. And, and as far as flipping houses, if you buy a house to, to, to hold it as a rental, no one says you can't sell it later. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's been a couple of times where we've had a rental and, you know, whether you're short on cash or, or an opportunity presents itself where a tenant wants to buy it, then you can sell it. And if you bought the property right, then, you know, to me, you even make more money by selling it later because if you sell it to a tenant, which has happened several times, you don't have to go in and fix it all up. The tenant generally likes it the way it is. Well, and to <clears throat> reinforce what Wes is saying, really, the fact of the matter is we, we call this real estate niches. So, it is a real estate niche, but it is definitely not investing. It's no. really just a job. So yeah. that's our position on it. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but it's not really investing. Yeah. So moving on to the next subject <clears throat> is the rehab business. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on the rehab business? Rehabbing like we Taking talked about Taking ugly before. houses and yeah. making it a retail new. You know, what do you think about that? It, again, it, you're going to be owning your own job. And one thing that I've typically found with rehabbers is they always have the same amount of money from flipping one house that they did the whole year of flipping 10 houses or however many they can flip. It's like they're always chasing that $10,000 cash house. Like they'll make a sale. Okay, well, they got. But the good 000. people, they make more than that, though. 
They the, can. The, if the, you can the, come the up with a machine. The real good ones, they, they, they make do. more than that. They, they, some of them can. Some of them can. Again, to me, look at the market you're in. All right? mm-hmm. if, if you're in California or Phoenix or Florida and the market's booming, I think you can make some money rehabbing. You know, you can certainly do that. But if you're in typical, you know, um, any other city, you know, around or you're kind of in a flat market, you know, if unless you can buy, you know, really, really good and, and it just and it takes time. I mean, it, you know, it's it's very capital intensive. I'll tell yeah. you, you know, the thing about rehabs that always scared me personally, mm-hmm. it's uh it, it wasn't the house or the finance, okay? That didn't scare me. But you got into the construction business. Yeah. I mean, so you're trying to learn the market and all that stuff, but all of a sudden, you kind of have to be a, a contractor right, right. of sorts, a general contractor for yourself. Yeah. Now, I suppose it, you know you can outsource it, but boy, oh boy, can you imagine that, just totally outsourcing that? Yeah, and, um, but we'll... Like we talked about earlier, too, you have to look at those, those middle numbers, and, and what you have to look at, you know, Pretty much, you know, six to eight months of vacancy by the time you're going to buy that thing and fix it up, you know. And so there again, you're going to get into, I think, in my opinion, most rehabbers, unless you're doing it big scale, your bottom line number is not going to be what you typically think it is, especially if you're a beginner and you've never done one. Well, the deal is, again, um, the rehab business, it's really more of a business than an investment. I mean, and so when you say that, you know, the people don't have, end up having much more is because... As they're doing it, they've spent the money. I mean, they do. Yeah, they live off, off of it. it. They do live off they, of they it. They live right. off of it, right. and and that's what ends up happening. I mean, they have to keep hunting that next deal. Right. Now, granted, it's not quite as intensive as the wholesalers and right. the bird doggers. I yeah. mean, those guys really got to do a lot of deals. Yeah. But the rehabbers, they're you're... always having to look down. They have to go. They have to fix it. Right. And you know, I will say, I mean, the society likes it. It is a valuable service. Well, it's I mean, sexy. someone's got to go. Right. I mean, it, it's sexy. People love to go in. They have the HGTV shows. That's they exactly. Have, I was know, thinking exactly the yeah, same. Those know, cable shows. People love that. They want to yeah. get in there and make something ugly pretty. Right. I mean, you have the Vanilla Ice Project or whatever they have on <laughs> TV. Vanilla Ice flipping houses down in mm-hmm. Miami, but. You know, if you're good at that, you know, if it generates cash, then what I would encourage you to do is is flip a few houses and roll that into some buy and hold properties. Because, I mean, in my opinion, most of the long-term wealth, or when you see wealth transfer from family to family, these are people who have property, they have wealth, and they've, they've transferred it from generations to generations. And I just only flipping houses, you're going to change your family tree very much. Yeah. And rehabbing is a is a pretty intensive job, but you know if you like it, that's fine. But it is not investing; yeah. it's a it's a business yeah. that you're gonna have to learn. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is uh, what about the foreclosure business? What you, what's your thoughts about the foreclosure business? You know, a lot of it's like the courthouse step stuff, right? I've been in the courthouse. I've been down there. You know, you see the twenty people who huddle <laughs> around. You know, the the real estate attorney. And I've been down there before. I've been down. Yeah. I, I listened, you know, earnestly about the uh, the houses that were being sold. I even went as far as you know, scoping out the property so that when I went to the courthouse, I would have an idea of what they were going for. And I would see people bid, and I would see people sitting off on the steps. You know, they would literally be counting out, ca- they would have cashier's checks in like twenty or $50,000 increments, and then they would be counting out cash. And number one, I wasn't in a position to even play ball with them. That was the first thing. <laughs> so, I mean, if you can't play ball, don't even be there. And I, I was just kind of going to kind of see if I was missing something. Yeah. But what I typically found that if you're good at finding deals, and I was finding, in my opinion, better deals through the typical MLS, a multiple listing service, or through our ads that we had out there. I was finding just as good deals without having to go and compete with these other investors who had more money than me down at the courthouse. So I like foreclosures, but I don't like to buy them at the courthouse. I either like to buy them before they go into foreclosures, those are some of the better deals, and we can, we'll can we get into some of those later, or after they've been foreclosed on, after they didn't sell at the courthouse steps and they're and they're on the market, there's some great, great deals. So the, the courthouse step thing has just never been a thing for me. Well, let me ask you this. Um, as far as, see, foreclosure, I, I look at it as a way of sourcing houses. In other words, it's a source to buy houses. Yeah. Are you saying that when people buy these foreclosures, are they like rehabbing and selling or are they keeping it for their portfolios or mm-hmm. what's happening I mean most, as a majority? Mo- I think the majority is they're selling them I, I agree with they're that. flipping them and selling them. Yeah. yeah you know what they're doing is again see Wes and I are about real estate investing mm-hmm. okay and we cover these niches because people confuse the niches with investing and mm-hmm. so 
If you're buying a foreclosure and you're actually hanging on to it because it's a great deal, I'm actually okay with that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I bought you know, several foreclosures. Right. I mean, dozens of them, yeah. Um, but the thing about it is the majority of it, if you go into the foreclosure steps and you're buying it and you're just flipping it out, I mean, it's just a buy and sell. You're, you're not much more than a car dealer. You know, that's really what it amounts to be, as far right. as I'm concerned. Right. I'm not trying to disparage anybody, but it's pretty much a job. It's a side. It, it is a business. It's not an investment, mm -hmm. and you don't get any of the benefits mm -hmm. unless you hold on to it. So, anyway, uh, the next one is uh, short sales. What are your thoughts about short sales? Short sales, they're, they're pretty hot right now. You know, if you banks are selling houses, I mean, like crazy, you know, because they've got to get these things off their books. So short selling has become very popular. Uh, a lot of homeowners like it because they're able to get out from under a mortgage where they owe more than what it's worth. And, but as far as short selling as a way of buying, what I have found is very time intensive. It's, I mean, you're going to spend a ton of time talking to the loss mitigation department, finding your way through, uh, you know, the loss mitigation department, leaving voicemails, getting calls backs and, you know, you can spend a majority part of a day just trying to find, you know, information. So short sales can be a great way of maybe getting a home at a reduced rate, um, but, but, you know, it's going to take some time. Well, the short sales experts that I know of, actually, you know a couple of them. I've talked about them before. Um, they're actually very good about it, mm -hmm. and um, they don't make any illusions that it's actually best. It's really a business operation for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, so what they do is they go after people that are willing to short sell, but they don't actually really take possession of her very long. They just right. negotiate a right. very steep discount. And then they try to and, sell oh, it. Oh, yeah. Uh, they're, they're hustling like heck right. to try to, uh, to sell it. But when they do sell it, they do make a, yep. a good chunk of change, i got to tell you. Um, and I recently had a conversation with my, one of my short sell friends. And I told him, you know, that my hat's to you. I said, you earned every bit of you know, the number he gave me. Right. You know, it, was a, it was a fairly healthy amount of money. And because I know the amount of time and effort he did. He hired people. He went through so much training. He had he put in so much work to build this operation. Mm -hmm. It is very labor intensive. You're on the banks. You know, I mean, I, I'm not an expert, but I'm just yeah. telling you, it, it was no secret. I mean, I could tell that it was going to be way more work that I would be willing to do. And if I had to do that much work, I would, quite honestly, I'd go find something else to do. Now, I just didn't care does, enough about it. Does he actually take title to it and then sell it, or is it just more or less a fee type thing? Do you know? Or I'm not Well, he collects the spread. I mean, I, I don't want to speak for him, yeah. but well, as I understand. Well, it's short sale in general. Do most, or is it like flipping a contract, or is it actually transfer to transfer? I yeah. mean, there are, uh, I guess a, a sense of a double closing. Okay. So I mean, I've I've heard of different scenarios. I have I didn't ask specifically, but I've heard different scenarios. They hold a they may pass title briefly right. to do it. Yeah. I mean, I've heard it done both ways. Okay. Now, yeah. obviously, things have changed dramatically within the last year or two mm -hmm. because there's been all kinds of weird things going on. Um, yeah. But yeah, he, he doesn't hold on to them uh, for very long. Is really the bottom line. Mm -hmm. You know whether he takes title or not. I mean he. Once they get that thing negotiated, I mean, they are hustling really, really hard mm -hmm. to market it out. Now, the the deal is, obviously, we've been in a tough market the last three or four years. So when they uh, when you sell it, they're not selling it full retail because nobody's right. buying it full retail. Right. So they're still passing. They're getting a very steep, very, very darn good deal, mm -hmm. and they're reselling it. That's still a good deal. Right, right. You know. And so they profit from the difference. But, I mean, there's no question about it. Money can be made in a lot of different ways. But boy, oh boy, you better be ready to pull up your sleeves and get in there. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's our position on short sales. I mean, you know, we kind of kicked it around. And I guess uh, you and I, just it's just never drawn to us, even though there was income opportunity. There is, yeah. Um, we were just never drawn to it. Yeah. All right. The other portion here is... Uh, I don't tra traditional landlording. So mm -hmm. what what are your what's your thoughts about that? I mean that that's a scary thought for a lot of people. Traditional it, it, landlording. It can be, you know, they're gonna and I guess you know one thing I'll say kind of as we get into traditional landlording. I guess a perfect world scenario would be for mm -hmm. you to you know find out which area you want to be in. Like for us is kind of the buy and hold traditional landlording. But you know if you had an operation where you could do some short sales or some rehabs, maybe one or two, 
you know, to kind of feed whichever route you want to go. That would be kind of a perfect scenario. Not just because we don't do it doesn't mean it's not right for other people. Like, yeah. you know, you may be very good at it. Um, so to have an operation where you, and that's kind of what I did when I started out was, you know, be open to a few different things uh, to, to maybe more than one option to make your common goal good. Now, the, the, the thing about land, I, I should say, you know, and I actually never asked you the question, <clears throat> or if, if I have, I haven't asked you in a long, long time. I actually tell people I don't love real estate. I really don't. I don't either. Um, you know, and a lot of people in the business, you know, they're, they are very passionate about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm interested in it. And obviously, we're talking about it. I've written books on it. Right. You know, we've, you know, we've spent a... Uh, you know, part of our professional lives and our identity is mm -hmm. part of the real estate. But, you know, people are actually really surprised when I don't love it. I mean, it's not all consuming. It's really, to me, mostly a wealth vehicle. Right, right. It, it's a tool. I mean, yeah. for, and I don't mean that in a, you know, in a sarcastic well, sense, but yeah. it's, you know, real estate, yeah, for me, you know, I looked at what options were, whether it's real estate, you have obviously the paper money, stocks, bonds, and mutual exactly. funds, or exactly. running a business, which, is, which would be very active. And, you know, so real estate, it just kind of made sense to me. But no, I'm not, you know, in love with it. It's just, Okay, it's so just, you're in agreement with me yeah, then. Right. Even not, to this day, you're not in love. Even though you're a broker, you're, a broker, you're an agent, you, know, you talk about it, you manage it, you're still not in love, huh? Well, I mean, I like what it can do. You know, I, I like the fact that, you know, you can have other people paying down assets that I own and, and no other business that, I, you know, can really do that. I mean, you, you can't yeah. go and buy stocks and say, okay, I want to have X number of people you know, give me ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month to go to go invest in my stock account. Yeah, that, that doesn't work. Well, it, that's exactly it. So, uh, so I bring up conventional landlording because landlording people see the outside stuff, and I'll right. be the first one to tell you, uh, some of the landlording aspects of property management is not a lot of fun. But I will also, but I would venture to say, it's not a lot of fun when you've got bad people, bad tenants. When I look at our history, all right. I would say that 80% of our people are actually fairly decent. Yes, they may have a hiccup now and again, but most of them are actually fairly decent. It's the 20% that'll just kill you. And yeah. so my belief is if you don't want to get eaten up by this property management, you should have a smaller portfolio, number one. Right. Have a smaller portfolio right. or... Buy more gold. conservative properties and that are not some, so intense. Right, or and have someone Man. else manage. You know, yes. if, if you can go in saying, okay, well, I, own, I want to own real estate, but I don't want to have anything to do with landlords, then you need to buy a deal knowing that you're not going to make any money and whatever profit that property puts off is going to go to a manager. And and we have heard we have, have heard of people who've done that. They buy a property, they turn it over to a manager. They buy another one, they turn it over to a manager. And, you know, they just that's their strategy. They just don't want to deal with it, and that can be okay. Well, you know, the fact of the matter is that, uh, I mean, it's no secret that you manage properties for other people. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think, you know, you would agree that you're not actively promoting. It's like, oh, you know, you know you're promoting this thing. Hey, let me manage your property. It's right. more like, hey, you know, you'll kind of do it if people it's, really want it. I mean, I'll be honest. It's there, a, it's there's, a case by case basis. Yeah, there's nothing, I would say, that there's fun about managing real estate. I yeah. mean, because you have to deal with, you know, yeah, they may be your house, but you're dealing with other people's problems. And yes. every house has, I mean, if you have 10 houses, you've got 10 roofs and multiple, you know, toilets and everything. So there's there's nothing particularly fun. That, I mean, I guess you can make some things fun about it. I mean, I do like dealing with people, you know, and you know, things like that. But, you know, for the most part, in, in kind of what Matt talked about, your 80-20 rule. I mean, that's that's been talked about in books and courses. And, exactly. And that seems to be true with everything. Yes. And, and this is the same way. I mean, you know, 80% of your problems are going to come from 20% of your tenants. And so right. I would say, you know, if you, you know, find the right properties that work for you, and for us, those have been not the low end. Definitely properties. not. Yeah. You know, stay away from we some have, of the low yeah. end and stay away from what I consider to be the, uh, er, the deadbeat areas. Right. You know, um, I have to tell you, I don't have a problem saying this. Phoenix City in Alabama, I mean. Yeah. It's tough. You know, that's a huge contrast. You yeah, know, it's tough. I'm sure there's going to be some people who are going to be upset with me yeah. for it, but you know what? It's just it's just a huge contrast. The legal system is different, and that may be a subject of another yeah. video. But it's just really tough. Right. But you know, here on the Columbus side, um, when you get good tenants with good property, 
you know, and you've got a system to sit down, and you make an effort to screen some of these tenants, you get a little system, right. life becomes a lot easier. A lot easier, yeah. A so lot stay away easier. from the low end, you know, pick yeah. pick the middle, you know, middle income, middle to high. The ones that are going to maybe cash flow a little bit, not as much as a low end, but in the long run, you know, 10 to 20 years down the road, you're going to be glad that you, you took did. a little bit of less cash flow, <laughs> and you've got a better asset, better tenants, and it just, it'll yeah. make your world a lot easier. But okay. So Talking about landlord, let me just say oh, one sorry. landlord. Okay. I mean, in okay. my opinion, obviously. I'm gonna <laughs> he make interrupted think, me, I'm so gonna, obviously I'm he's like... a claim. You know, whether you want to call it tired landlording or whatever you want to call it, in the end, I'm just going to say, I think I will win. I'll just say that. Okay. I mean, you know, we, we talk about other things, rehabbing, you know, wholesaling, you know, things like that. And if you can, if you can stick to it in some way, shape, or form, you know... Warren Buffett, you know, he, he's a buy and hold guy. Not in real estate, of course, but, you know, he, he's a buy and hold. Yeah. There's been wealth that's, you know, transferred from family to families from, you know, buy and hold, big asset bases and stuff like that. So, you know, my opinion, buy and hold, if you can stick it out, you'll win. Okay. And on that note, we're going to take a break. Welcome back from the break. Um, in continuing on the last segment, we talked about uh, real estate niches. We completed talking about conventional landlording and our thoughts on that. Now, closely related to, at least for us, is that's closely related is owner financing and notes. Basically, we get to sell uh, our properties. Mm -hmm. So basically, we, could, we get cash flow without the landlord responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, you know, yes, technically we have already sold the property, but for the time being, it's been a wonderful thing. It's it been can, like clockwork. You don't have the asset, but it's a nice little middle ground. Well, you kind of have the asset. I mean, in a way, as, as, as far as the stream of income, and, and the, you have the asset as far as the difference between what you owe and what you sold it for. So it's still an asset on, on your por in your portfolio. But yes, you, you don't hold title to the asset, I guess. Right. Yeah. And, and the only reason why we got into the notes business is because we were doing lease options, which is sort of a blend mm -hmm. of a conventional landlording and carrying the notes. And we were, we had to do some note situations. I mean, I'm not going to get into the details because we don't have enough time in this program. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it was the right financial decision because the fact of the matter is you and I have more property mm -hmm. than we have to really worry about acquiring mm -hmm. at this point. Right. And so strategically speaking, you know, you know, turning some of them loose just for the cash flow and the stability really right. helps us all dramatically. Yeah, so I just want to say though, mm -hmm. if you decide to do this with some of your property, you need to have, there's a, I mean, just a couple of key factors I just want to throw in here is that. He cannot, he's going to have help. to throw it. I mean, <laughs> he won't let the concept you gotta, lie. You, you have to, I mean, have some history with who you do it with, right? Don't, <laughs> Yeah, if you have a tenant for two months, he's like, oh, this would be a great tenant for me to... Wes, you know, this isn't a how-to video. Don't ignore him. He's getting into how-tos. Oh, yeah. We don't well, have then, time then, for that. Well, but it, okay, you go, ahead, say, go ahead. Go then give you him a email Matt before you do it and say, tell me everything I need to know. All right? That's no, it. No, no, Next no. no, no. You can email him, too. No, no, no. You can email him. Well, the thing about it is, he just does, he just doesn't want anybody to fall into a trap without... Yeah, you know, because if you give the... If you give a house to the wrong person, you're going to regret it. You're going to regret it. Well, that's not what I was taught in some of these courses and seminars. If you do this and this, this is what's going to happen, just like clockwork. It'll happen all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to happen. It's going to happen. That things don't go wrong if you do everything you're supposed to do. Anything can go wrong in, a, in, in even in a perfect world. There is no perfect world. So oh, I don't know. So, Sounds like a cynical so real estate can, investor is. Transferring a property... You know, holding on to the note can work. It can be a great tool. It's got to be with the right people. Right. And, uh, and so, the point, so anyway, make no mistake about it. It does require more education to do all of this thing. But it is a, uh, a little nice little niche that we kind of fell into. Mm -hmm. And it works. Um, and what can I tell you? There's cash flow through gener creating financing for other people. So mm -hmm. anyway, um, what about, let's talk about commercial real estate. 
this is a subject that uh, you and I were actually trying to get into around 07 before the bottom fell out. Yeah. yeah. Kind of derailed us a little bit, wouldn't you say? Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> set us back. Yeah. I would say for me, kind of like we, I talked about in a previous episode, I mean, I'm always looking to learn. I'm always looking for what's yeah. the next step to go. And, and so just like you're in whatever stage you're in, we're all in, in the same, you know, uh, cycle of wanting to grow into the next stage so uh, for for me personally i think in matt and i mean commercial real estate was kind of the direction we were going or the direction we wanted to go and and we're obviously all just like you are we're all you know bound by you know um our beliefs or, or maybe it's cash or capital or credit or whatever it may be you know holding yeah. you back so yeah that's something so but commercial real estate yeah it's a direction that i feel that that i'm going we're going and that um, you know, it's just kind of a matter of time and, you know, when things are right, and just like you want to get your, you know, maybe your first house started off right. I mean, doing commercial deals, you got to make sure you get that started off right. Because, I mean, yeah. you know, one bad commercial deal can wipe out a lot of stuff. Now, I, I, in the interest of uh, disclosure, um, you know, part of my comfort in real estate is, you know, my mom was involved in it, you mm -hmm. know, of course, on a smaller scale than we are. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you're brought up in it and, you know, you kind of get used to some of it. And uh, so, you know, I already understood about the management. I understood about leases and contracts. In fact, I did a lot of them in the old-fashioned typewriter. This was mm -hmm. before the word processor and all that. So, you know, I, I got a little comfort in that. And same thing with the commercial real estate. Uh, in my profession, you know, my mom had, you know, a little piece of commercial real estate. But in my professional life, I also worked for an investor that had commercial real estate. So, I mean, I didn't feel what it was like to own it per se right. but i certainly understood it from you know behind the scenes from an operational standpoint because i was doing the accounting and so forth so you know uh commercial real estate i think has potential now the one thing i want to take the time in this segment to talk about is you and i have a little bit of a despair i think we have a little bit of a disagreement um my contention for people is i believe people should do a few a few single family houses before they go to commercial real estate but you're starting to tell people just jump right in you know i mean <laughs> i you know i'm not from the belief to think that people aren't smart enough if you want to to skip the residential thing altogether if you want to you know if, if you're smart enough to to again filter a lot of the stuff then it's to me having a residential career residential real estate career is not a prerequisite to a commercial you know jump into commercial property it's just you know just, well, it, it, it's not a prerequisite, but uh, don't you think that some people should have some training wheels? You don't think that that's a... Not necessarily, because commercial is a whole different ball game. It's, it's a whole new ball. And it depends on what level, you know, you want to play on. Like, I mean, I, I know a guy personally who he sold a business. Yeah. He got, you know, a, 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 a truckload of a cash, you know. Yeah. And so, and he jumped right into commercial real estate. He started building car washes. He got involved with other projects. Of, you know, he got involved with these big companies who they actually buy a big plot of land. They bring in the red lobsters and the smoky bones yeah. and whatever else. And so... I mean, for a guy like that, he never owned a house other than the house he lived in. So for yeah. a guy like that that has that truckload of cash, you mean to tell me, oh, you need to go and buy, you know, a three-bedroom, two-bedroom no, house? No, before, no, you know? no. But, the, but, but, the, but what you're talking about in that particular case study is you're talking about an individual who already understood business. You are, and yeah, so yeah. when he went into commercial real estate, it really is a business in itself. Yes. Yeah, it and was so a business, I think he, he had the fundamentals. But he partnered up. I mean, he had no background in, in, in um commercial real estate but he I guess but he partnered with people who did so he found a way to make it work for him so right all I'm saying so but I've also told people that you know <laughs> you can spend 10 years acquiring a portfolio like maybe we've acquired and that's that's true you could also spend the same 10 years or probably more like five years or I maybe agree. even one year you know if you were if you can muster up the, the, the gumption and take down one commercial property, whether that be a 200 unit apartment complex or a 400 unit storage building, um, you could possibly have a you know a similar asset base to someone that's really worked hard at cranking out these something to be said houses. There. So you have economies of scale. So when I see people struggling to get started, I know how hard it is to buy a house and to get it going and things like that. So if you think you might have an interest in commercial real estate, then I would say start looking into it because you'll find too, that's where the big boys play. Well, that, I agree with that. However, if going in our, in our previous episode, we talked about real estate beginners. Yeah. They're already paralyzed with the thought of a single house or a couple growing it to two or three houses. 
Are you? They can't even get over the, the house. That's right. Those. That's that's not the audience I'm talking. To. The, the, audience, <laughs> the audience I'm talking to may be somebody like me. You know, who's and a I'm little believe, more open, not right, quite so paralyzed. Open, right. Right. And I mean, uh, so I believe if you're watching this video, that you are more than likely one of these people that you know you can do you. You know, you're not going to get paralyzed like you know a lot of these people. So if you say, "Hey, I'm not scared of an apartment complex. It's just sticks and bricks and numbers," or "I'm not scared of a." a um, a storage unit facility, but I would say pick something that you are comfortable with. I mean, like on that note, I mean, I'm comfortable with um, commercial property with monthly paying tenants. And I know that makes it sound kind of crazy, but when you look at commercial real estate, you've got a big conglomeration of, of different things. So for me, I'm comfortable with an apartment building or a storage unit facility. Those are kind of two things that I like to look for. I don't know anything about a medical building. Or I don't know really much about a strip mall and stuff like that. Yeah. So, um, but if you understand the numbers, it can be. And I've heard other people say that. I'm, I've heard, um, I don't want to use Donald Trump's name in this video, but I've heard, yeah. you know, Donald Trump say, it's just as easy to take down a two or three million dollar building as it is a dumpy duplex. So with that in consideration, I think you can do it. I, I absolutely okay. do. Okay. Well, I just thought it was, our audience members would appreciate our little uh, right, disagreement yeah. here. The disagreement I is, still... I believe in you and Matt does. That's what we're saying. <laughs> Okay, all right. Throw me under no, the bus kidding, kidding, in front of the whole right, world. No, no, okay. uh, Matt believes you can Well, do my thing is um, some people need some intermediary steps, and yes. that's what I'm getting at. If yes. you need the intermediate steps, I personally think I needed the intermediate steps. It's not going to hurt. Right. Um, it's definitely not going to hurt. But I do agree with you that... You know, if if I had to do it all over again, I probably would spend less time. I wouldn't have, like you said, you know, right. just spend ten years. Right. You know, you know, go ahead, spend a healthy amount of time, get the the kinks work done, and right. go ahead, take it to a different level. Yeah. But you know, just as we were getting ready to go, the recession happened, and here we are still dealing with it. So that's yeah. that's that is what it is. Right. Right. But anyway, that's our take on the commercial real estate. Now, the next three things that I'm going to kind of touch on. Um, is really not a, a niche, but they're kind of uh, fields of expertise that I just want to at least spend a couple of minutes on. So let's talk about Section 8. We have some s agreements and disagreements on Section 8. Mm -hmm. So you kind of like Section 8. I kind of am on the fence. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, and, and at the same time, I like it, but it's with a little bit of you know, uh, you have to I, take an occasional breath now and again, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely comes <laughs> with some. It definitely comes with some contradictions. Yes, uh, Section Eight is something that uh, we are in. Um, mm -hmm. I've kind of pulled out of it, but I'm still in it. Uh, Wes has gotten more into it, and we have these little friendly debates. And stay tuned on a future episode. We will definitely get into it in a lot of. Uh, a lot more meat and potatoes about it, and we're going to get into some controversy. You're going to like that. Stay tuned for that episode for Section 8. So, anyway, moving on. Um, a friend of mine, uh, I'll give out a shout out to my friend, uh, Darla Anderson. She's really doing great with these vacation rentals, and what she does is she takes nice houses that would never be able to be cash flowed under normal circumstances, and she makes them cash flowable. Mm -hmm. Because what it is is, you know, these vacation rentals, these people are paying really what amounts to be hotel rates on mm -hmm. a daily rate. So when they come in for a week or two, she gets a deposits and she screens them. They're all credit worthy. Mm -hmm. And, she, you know, obviously she makes sure they're not college kids and she moves them in. It's already furnished and they move out. Very little drum because she's dealing with good credit people. If you don't have a credit card, you ain't getting in. Mm -hmm. And I love it. Mm -hmm. I love it. And yes, there's a little bit more upfront costs mm -hmm. in terms of furnishing, uh, the furnishings and, and so forth. But I've talked to her about it, and apparently she's been able to get some nice furnishings with very little money, mm -hmm. uh, relatively little money. But you know, she has a very artistic touch. And one day I hope to interview her so that you get to know more about it. But I just want to give a little touch on vacation rentals. And Another friend of mine, you know, who you've met year, a few years back, was Marlene, mm -hmm. and she did student rentals, and she was also able to uh, get cash flows from you know these otherwise uncash flowable properties. Yeah, basically by taking one house that has three bedrooms, and instead of renting the house, they rent a bedroom, a bedroom, and a bedroom. Well, she so. would also take these, five, make them into five bedrooms, no, into yeah. five bedroom houses. You yeah. know, so she take, found something that was that could be expanded right. and she'd get these college kids signing as a group mm -hmm. 
You know, so if one person didn't fall out, the rest of the people were on the hook. Uh, yeah, exactly. And of course, she has no problems getting the parents involved because she knows that the kids themselves right. are not necessarily going to be responsible. But if she has a direct line to the yeah. parents, right? You know, um, you know, it's a it's a huge motivator for those kids to get in line. And both of those are great examples for you to look at. You know, your area, whether you're in a vacation area or maybe you're near a college campus. These are two um, ladies, friends of ours, who. Have, you know, yes, they're doing, I guess, tired landlording, but with a spin. They're doing it with a twist. They are doing it with a spin. Yeah. It, it is true. There is still a management, but make right. no mistake. Um, yes, they will do it for other people, but it always started out with their core property. Right. It was a way to figure out how to make their assets perform, have right. somebody else pay for the asset. But the, that's the key. And the philosophy is the same. The philosophy is getting other people's money to coming in to paying down Absolutely. assets that they own. So. You know, it's with a twist, but uh, with the same philosophy. Right. So I hope you uh, uh, enjoyed our little segment on the real estate niches. Mm -hmm. And um, stay tuned. We're going to take a little short break, and we're going to come back with our next topic.